I can actually just delete the red, the red, the red coated people in in the near pod. All right. Now we were introducing ourselves last time to the amazing model that we know of as the PPF. Now, apologies, Eason, you won't have seen this before. This will be <coughs> mind blowing to you potentially. But this is the production possibility frontier. And it is a model that I've referred to as a supermodel. All right. The reason why I like to refer it to, to it as a supermodel is the fact that it is able to encompass, to encapsulate, to have a whole lot of other economic theories that it's able to illustrate. So we've said that this is production possibility frontier. So it is the representation, if you will, of what is possible to produce. So if we were to use this very model and imagine we were producing wheat and imagine we were producing cotton, then this curve would be the maximum we could produce of wheat and cotton. Right? Hence production possibility frontier. The idea being is that if we are inside the curve, then we're not doing the best we possibly can because we're not on the limit. And any points that are represented outside of the curve out here, those are what we classify as being unobtainable because we've got scarcity involved. We've got a limit, a limiting factor, if you will, based on the resources that we have and the technology that we have. And if you've ever seen movies from like the 1970s and 1980s, right, and you'll say, wow, the, the CGI there, oh, that's awful. Yeah? The technology has improved so much now that you can see these amazing movies with all sorts of special effects, et cetera, in them that are very, very different from what used to be seen uh, in the movies from, well, when I was watching movies in, in my youth, all right? Uh, so, yeah, one of my first superhero movies uh, was a Spider-Man movie. It was a live-action Spider-Man movie. And they they didn't have CGI, so to speak. So what they had is, is, is Spider-Man would kind of throw his hand towards the bad guy, and then someone from behind him would basically throw a big net <laughs> and the neck would cover the bad guy. That was how the CGI worked back then, all right? Uh, so, yeah, when they talk about Spider-Man actors, Spider-Man actors, then this, the one that I saw back then uh, was one of the first of the live actions of the Spider-Man. And that's not taking into account the one, the, there's one, I think, in India, isn't there? There's a Spider-Man in India and he flies. I don't know if you've seen that one. Um, but yes. So the technology that we have will improve. And as the technology improves, right, we get more AR and VR and robots and all of those sorts of things. And all of a sudden, what was possible, what was impossible to do now is possible. So we're able to produce more. Right? Just going, let's just jump back to the sharing just for a second. Uh, the meet for a second. Have you seen the drone delivery technologies that there are? Has anybody seen all of that? You may not have been part of it, right? But you may have seen it. So, for example, Domino's Pizza in the in the states uses robots to deliver their pizza, right? There are some hotels that have robots delivering the food instead of people. You might have gone to a restaurant where it's the robot taking the order. There's one in, there's a restaurant in, what's the name of the mall? Um, one Utama. In the One Utama mall, there's a restaurant in there. I think it's a Japanese restaurant. And there's a robot that takes your order. Yeah. I don't think the technology is particularly complicated. But if you are interested in that sort of thing, I can show you lots of these new fangled technology sorts of videos. There's... Uh, the drones and they fly and they drop the Amazon parcel at your doorstep. There's, that's the technology that's now coming about. And the, the warehouses now, right, that are completely automated. It's just robots delivering and organizing everything, right? That never used to be like that. It always used to be people, physically people doing all of these things. So now we're able to produce more and more and more and therefore our production possibility frontier curve 
will be shifting out potentially. We still need to make decisions. So that's what this was illustrating. You remember this the other day. We were illustrating that if we were to choose as society, one of the economic questions was how much of a product we were going to produce. We we're going to produce more cotton. By producing more cotton, that meant that we were needing to produce less wheat in this context. We have wheat and cotton being produced. So by producing more cotton, we produce less wheat. And that's the opportunity cost idea. That's the idea that we have to give up or we lose the next best opportunity or option by making a decision. So you go and, you're going to go and see a movie when you're allowed, right? And you have to choose between, say, two movies. By going to see the one movie, you give up the option of seeing the other opportunity. So that is your opportunity cost. So we had a discussion about these PPC curves. There are going to be more conversations because this idea that we can shift the PPC curve out, that's going to illustrate the idea of economic growth. And then if we have, like we have at the moment, declining economies, shrinking economies, that would be the PPC curve shifting in, shifting inwards, which isn't a good thing either. Right, so you've drawn your PPC curves, you've illustrated opportunity cost and economic growth. That's good practice to be able to do. There's Vilfredo Pareto, we mentioned him. We talked about how he created this idea of an optimization sort of approach, where not only can you think about the allocation of the resources, but you can also think about the best allocation, or how to give out the resources in the most efficient way, so that it's not possible to make anyone better off actually without making someone else worse off, because that would then be the best you could possibly do right? by doing it that way around. Now, there is a little wee, there's a couple of little wee extra tricks with regards to the PPC curve. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing now, and I'm going to show you, I will open up a jam board, open up a jam, all right, and start a new one. And I'll show you one, one of the tricks, and then we're going to discuss that particular trick. And then we will discuss, then we'll have a look at something else, and then we're going to discuss another trick. All right, so hopefully you can all see the Jamboard. The link should be available to you. All right, where is it here? Here it is. All right, so the Jamboard should be there. You should be able to join it. You can see what it is I'm drawing. All right, so we're going to do a wee drawing. All right, so very quickly, I'm going to draw a PPC curve. Here it is. All right, axis drawn. Don't panic too much. I've, I've done one or two of these before. All right, so you have your PPC curve. All right, now there are, as said the other day, you can have all sorts of different goods listed. You could have capital goods, you could have consumer goods, you could have good A and good B. You can have guns and butter, you can have wheat and cotton, all of those other sorts of things. All right? Now, we've discussed the idea of opportunity cost with regards to a PPC curve. We've discussed the idea of optimization. Okay, so what happens if we put the two ideas together, All right? Oh, scary thought. So let's have a look on, I'm going to, so we're going to be on the PPC curve, All right? So I'm going to illustrate for you a couple of points. So there is point A. Uh, here's another point here. This is point B. And there's another point here. This is point C. Now, each of these points, you'll notice, gives you a different combination of B and a different combination of A. All right? So whatever the quantities are, all right? so, combination, so combination B gives you this quantity of A and this quantity of B. Combination C gives you this quantity of A and this quantity of B, all right? 
So if your society is thinking we want more B than A, then you quite probably are going to go for C as the option to choose. If society says we want more A than B, then maybe point A is where you're going to choose. So it very much depends where on the curve you want to be. Now, as I said, what I'm wanting to do is to link the idea of efficiency or optimality right, to this model. So if we are on the curve here, anywhere on the curve here, we say we are efficient. Right? That we are productively. All right, so I'm just going to move that over. And what I'm meaning by that is that if we're on the curve, we're doing the best we can. We've got scarcity because we can't produce out here. We could be producing in here, but that indicates a degree of unemployment, of underutilizing our resources. So if we're on this curve, that's the best we can possibly do. So therefore, we're going to use that concept, efficiency, Right, the best we can possibly do given the resources that we've got. So this is the best production that we can do to be on the curve. However, one of these curves contains something else. One of these points contains something else. It contains another type of efficiency. And this type of efficiency is called allocative efficiency. All right, so that key concept of efficiency, now we can break it into two. We can have productive efficiency and we can have allocative efficiency. So remember we talked about what, how, and for whom, right? Those were our three economic questions. So what was going to be produced and how it's going to be produced, that's all about production. Right, so the what and the how are going to be answered by this idea here of efficient production. For whom? Who gets the goods and services? How does society decide who gets the goods and services? That's actually a, a decision that falls under this category, allocation or allocative efficiency. So if you're not familiar with the word allocation, it's quite literally about giving out. Right, So you're cutting the pizza up how do you decide who gets how many pieces and the size of the different pieces of the pizza? That's an allocation question. So there's an efficient way to do that. Now, the trick with regards to the PPCs is, here it is, is that this efficient allocation, there can be only one efficient allocation. So although I have indicated three spots, only one of these three spots is actually allocatively efficient. Just one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight. No, highlight, where's my, do I have a highlighter? I can do a circle. I can do a laser. Let's do a laser. All right, now. There's A here, B here, and C here. But I've said only one of them is allocatively efficient. Now, how are we going to tell which one is allocatively efficient? So what we're going to do is I'm going to jump back to the meat. And I'm going to open up the chat box. What do you think we are meaning by allocative efficiency? Now, if you have a guess, if you're not sure and you think, ah, you can ask Dr. Google if you need. But what does allocative efficiency mean? Now, check an answer into the chat. Now, when the production of goods corresponds with consumer preferences. Wow, Zafan, that's a good answer. Right? And it is absolutely correct. Right? Is there anybody else who's got a version of that answer that they have discovered? 
All products are distributed efficiently to all consumers in a market, says Adam. That's absolutely correct as well. Anybody else got variations on a theme? Efficient market, all goods and services optimally distributed amongst buyers in an economy. Wow. Excellent. Any other variations on a theme? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to illustrate to you that depending where you go, uh, what book you look at, what site you're reading, you're going to get different definitions. Yeah? Now they are all, well, these ones that I have seen, they are all correct. However, they look different. Right? And the point being is that you need to figure out what this all means. So let's have another look at the Jamboard. Right? I'm hoping you can still see the Jamboard. I'm going to illustrate, and what I'm going to choose to do is I'm going to pick one that's going to be allocatively efficient, and I'm going to pick B. I'm going to say B is allocatively efficient, and I'm going to tell you why B is allocatively efficient, because this is what happens in B. Right? In B, we're going to find all of the goods that are demanded, are going to exactly equal all of the goods that are being supplied. Now, you don't need to worry too much about this model. We're going to come back to it. This is called a market model. So what all of these explanations that you've found in the chat, so when production of goods and services corresponds with consumer pre preferences, what is that saying, Zafan? That's saying that when supply equals demand. Here it is. Uh, then the next one says, when all products are distributed efficiently to all consumers in a market, when supply equals demand. And the next one says, an efficient market whereby all goods and services are optimally distributed amongst buyers in an economy, when supply equals demand. They're all saying exactly the same thing. They're just coming at it from a different way. So the code that the, I guess, well, life hack sort of idea is that the way to figure out where allocative efficiency is is to figure out where the market is in what we call equilibrium which we're going to come back to in a minute in a bit i need to worry about it too much at the moment it's a new term for some of us all right essentially what we mean here is that demand for this good good equals supply now, what that means is that that's only one place where that happens. None of these other ones have an equilibrium. None of these other points, nowhere else on the PPC is there any form of equilibrium. It's only at this one place. So on a PPC curve, there will only be one point that is allocatively efficient, but all of the points on the curve are productively efficient. All right, now that is a lot to take in, and we are going to come back to that idea. All right, that's a little wee secret with regards to the PPC curve. That's secret number one. Secret number two is going to come soon. All right, so you can see now this guy, Vilfredo Pareto, created this tool, this idea of, this idea of, sorry, yep, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Is it possible that A or C could be allocatively efficient, as in it depends on the product? Yes. There's the short answer to the question is absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I purposefully chose B. All right. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. A or C could, could be allocatively efficient. The point being is only one of them can be allocatively efficient. So you are actually choosing one, right? And it has to be the one that supply equals demand. So in those other cases, supply doesn't equal demand, is, is the point. Right? But yes, it could have been any of them. I deliberately chose B. One of the reasons why I chose B is because I used to ask um, learners why I chose B. And... I tend to get asked the number one question, I tend to get asked, well, number one statement that tends to be asked is the idea that because it's in the middle, right? People say that 
I put it as B because then it's like 50-50 between the two products and that's not why. So I deliberately do it to try and draw that answer out of people so that they're not making the assumption that allocative efficiency is where it's exactly 50-50 between the two production processes. All right, now, let's move on. Our next key term, there it is, look at it, ah, there it is. Now, some of you have seen this term before because you will have seen it in, in economics at IGCSE level. We also need to know about it in year 12 for IB. All right, now, unfortunately, if you're not familiar with the Latin language, this is actually Latin, right? Now, a long, long time ago, people started using Latin in science. I don't know if you've come across Latin terms, perhaps in biology, right, before, but there is, this is, this is Latin. Now, I'm not particularly worried as to how you pronounce it, and there's going to be a few of you who might misspell it, and that's absolutely fine as well, so long as it's relatively readable in the sense that you can understand what you're getting at, okay? Now, there are a few of you who already know what this term means, and for a, a number of you, you'll be brand new to it. All right, so first task is, back to the meat, here we go. All right, how do you think you would pronounce that word? That phrase. How do you think it's pronounced? Have a go. You're not going to be wrong. Okay. I just want to. I just to be honest. I just want to hear you say it. Yeah. Because it's quite a challenging phrase. What do we think? Who's brave? Satirish Arabus. Oh, good man, Faisal. Absolutely. Whoa, that's a good way to do it, Adam, to do it um, phonetically. Well done, Harry Potter spell. <laughs> it does, yes, you're right. It does sound like a bit of a magic spell. Uh, I remember at university when, I, I know I'm talking a long time ago and I apologize for this, all right? But one of the things at university, when I was at university, the university lecturers are probably vastly different from what they are now. Right, and they were these old men, and right, they used to bellow at you, and they used to tell you you were wrong more often than you were right, and they had these real strong biases towards you had to say things absolutely correctly, right? You had to pronounce these terms. These terms they were like magic, like Harry Potter spells, so you had to actually say them correct, correct. You had to say them right. Otherwise, they would not like you, yeah? And I remember this, this one lecturer of mine, he was, he was an interesting character, and he used to tell us that the correct way to say this particular word in Latin is caterus paribus. <laughs> well, because the, the, the C in, in the Latin alphabet is apparently a K sound, um, but I don't know. I, I, I am not an expert in Latin by any stretch of the imagination. I just took him at his word. Um, yeah, the, T is, the C is supposed to be pronounced as a K. Yeah, that's what he was getting at. Um, and again, I don't know, I'm not, as said, I'm definitely not a, a Latin expert. I'm not expecting you to be able to pronounce these things correctly, as I said. I'm also not worried if you misspell them when you're writing them, right? So long as when you do attempt to spell them that you get it close enough that it's actually readable, right? I tend to refer to it as ceteris paribus because it's a C, right? So to me, it's ceteris paribus. All right, now, if you are a, I, th I think this is Korean. If you know about Korean, I've, I've included a wee hidden message for you there in Korean. Does anybody know what that says? Do we have any Korean speakers? None. We usually have one or two. 
No Korean speakers. Oh, well. Secret message then. All right. You'll miss out on that one. That's okay. And the reason why you'll miss out on it is because I can't remember what it says. I <laughs> put it in there and I can't remember what it says. That's all right. It is a big theory, Ceteris Paribus. Now, the reason why I'm stressing this this year is because it is a, it is a specific bullet point in your learning objectives. And the reason why is because what the word actually, what the phrase actually means. So uh, those of you who are quick on the march, let's see what Dr. Google says that Ceteris Paribus means. Where you go. And then you're going to see, hopefully, why it's important. Yep, got an answer already. Oh, good work, Sarfan. That's actually quite a, a good explanation. What about the rest of you? Come on, quickly. There you go. Chuck one in. What does Dr. Google say? Ceteris paribus. What does it mean? Good work. Yes. What else is there? Are there other variations on a theme? Oh, good work, Senna. Yeah. Oh, that's very good, Eason. Yes. I like that one. Well, there you go, young Y. Yes, you've got a more um, every man on the street sort of answer. Well done. Yeah, Adam, that's a good way to explain it. I like the, the, um, the asterisk is basically around the word other. Last chance for last chance. Good. Yes. Not a big one. A small one. So you got maths in 10 minutes, son. Huh? All right. Absolutely. All other things being equal. Well done. And all other factors being kept constant or unchanged. What else do we have? All other things being held or held constant and equal or held constant. All other things, all other things. Here we go. If all else is equal. Here we go. This, is, this was sinners. This was a good one. All other things equal. Every other variable are kept constant. All right. Ah, Faisal, let's have a look. All other variable conditions are the same. The other things also equalize well. That's quite technical, that one. Um, and Yong Wai has got the simplest, most straightforward one, assuming nothing else changes. All right, so team, let's have a think about this idea of ceteris paribus. Let's look at that idea in depth because that's what we need to do. This is part of the idea of economics being a science, right? If economics is a science, then we are social scientists. And what we're doing is we're testing our world. So we need to, and we will do a little bit more in depth with regards to what that means, right? But essentially what we're doing is we're creating theories about the world, using economic models, right? Creating hypotheses, right? About how the world works with regards to microeconomic thinking and macroeconomic thinking. We're also gonna think about the behavior of consumers and the behavior of producers and why they behave that way. And part of that actually links into the idea that we talked about before about different values people have. Right? And therefore they think certain ways because of the values that they have. Right? So as scientists, we need to have experiments where we test our ideas. We're going to attempt to build up laws, if you will, kind of like science laws, which you might say are laws of the universe, kind of type idea. But we need to have laws that are about the economy. So we're going to be making assumptions in order to ensure that any models we create are going to be workable, right? And we've already seen that. We've seen a PPC curve where we made an assumption 
that there are only two goods being produced. Well, I don't know many economies where you'd say that there are only two goods being produced. I mean, I, hmm. I mean, if you go all the way to, let's go down to a really small economy. Um, I don't know. Some of the islands in the Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean, some of the islands that are close to New Zealand, you could make an argument that they might get close to being producing only two goods, maybe. Um, you'd make an argument, you know, maybe uh, Fiji. No, Fiji would have tourism. Tourism and fish, yeah, maybe. Uh, but most economies, you're going to say that there will be more than just two goods being produced. So we've made that assumption. In order for the PPC to work as a model, it has to have only two goods being produced. So we're going to be making these assumptions. And one of the things that we have to be able to do is to exclude anything that's going to knock these assumptions. Anything that's going to prevent our experiment from working, we're actually going to need to keep that away. So anything that might possibly affect decisions that humans have, anything that might be out of the, the, the variables, the, the multitudinous variables that there are, we're going to have to ignore all of those and just focus in on the one or two variables that we need in our experiment. Right? Otherwise, that experiment isn't going to work. Yeah? So if we are considering, you know, I, I don't know, physics, and you're thinking to yourself, you know, when you kick the soccer ball, where does it go, right? If you were to take all of the other variables into account, then you've kind of got that sort of chaotic system at play, and you might end up with something that is completely not working the way you think it will work, right? And it's the same for economics. In order for the laws that we have created, in order for those laws to work, then we have to have this idea of ceteris paribus. We have to have, if you like, a kind of like a ring fence or a fence around our experiment to protect it from any outside interference. Otherwise, those experiments won't work. And therefore, you've got to make the argument about economics as a social science. You know, does it, you know, how scientific is it? You know, how, tr how much of the truth are we actually finding in our laws and the principles that we analyze? Uh, and that's a little bit TOK, but ceteris paribus is a brilliant concept to use when you are studying something. I'm just going to ignore that. I'm going to ignore that. I'm just going to focus in on this bit. All right. But by doing that, are you creating the truth? Because reality, as we know, is incredibly complicated. Right? Even people and just some of the decisions that we make are very complicated. Why did you make that decision? Well, because of the law, you did. Blah, 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 blah. But the reality is going to be you are a person. You've got all these emotions and thoughts. And uh, the way your brain works might be very different from the way everybody else's brain works. You know, I mean, there might be connections. You might be an identical twin, right? in which case... Maybe you do behave exactly the same as your twin, but maybe you don't. You know? Even people who are siblings, right? brothers and sisters, you might still behave in a different way, right? make different decisions. So we try and eliminate anything that's going to affect those experiments that we have, trying to protect the experiments so that it can actually predict what we want it to predict. So in a way, we're kind of stacking the deck. We're kind of making it so that we can prove what we want it to prove. So you, you're going to be able to make that argument there about whether we are a science at all. So that's the idea of this ceteris paribus. That's why it's so important, because if we don't have it, a lot of economics is just going to fall apart right? if we do not have that particular principle. So here's your next challenge. There it is. It's a fill in the gaps exercise, otherwise known as a close exercise, because what you need to do is close up the sentences with the correct answers. So away you go. Have a go at that.
chuck the correct answer into where you think it goes in the sentence. Give you 30 odd seconds to have a go at that. I'm just going to check that my son's doing his maths. Oh, whoa. good answers. Well done, team. All right, keep going. Got a couple more to have a go. Fill in the gaps. Give you about another 30 seconds. Oh, very good. Excellent work, team. Well done. So, as you all have correctly worked out, social sciences are looking at human behavior, human decision making. So, economists have to hold anything that might possibly affect those decisions, other than those being tested for, completely outside of the model. Otherwise, the experiment won't work. Hence, the idea of ceteris paribus. Right, or all other variables, all other factors being equal, or all other factors being held constant, or all other variables being excluded, if you like. So that's the idea of ceteris paribus. Quite an exciting one, and a good one, because it's an individual bullet point in your specific learning objectives, it's a really good one for them to ask you about. And because they're able to link it, obviously, to the models that we learn, and because they're able to link it to the idea of economics as a social science, you know, there's good exam questions that could come out from that. There's good analysis that they could get from that. And it's also fun to talk about in TOK. Aha, now here was the question we were asked before. Can a PPF be a straight line? And if so, what would that mean? Now, I've written something here. I believe this is in Mandarin. Uh, we got any Mandarin speakers? Anybody who's able to translate what that means? I can't remember. <laughs> All right. Do anybody know what the Mandarin says? Interesting. Is that what it says? Most interesting. Okay. There you go. Hey, what a multilingual class this is, I tell you. All right. Now, so if the PPF is a straight line, so have a look at the, the image. All right, because there's a clue in the phrase, what does it mean? All right, so if it is a straight line, have a look at what I'm illustrating here with this one. Don't worry about hours worked and hours leisure. That's just good A and good B, right? But have a look at what's being illustrated and see if you can figure out what it would mean if the PPF was a straight line. All right. And tell me what you think. You can either put it into the chat or you can voice your opinion. What do you think it means if the PPF is a straight line? It 
has to do with what was being illustrated in that image. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, good. Yes. Oh, gosh, you're rock stars. Absolutely right. Well done. The opportunity cost doesn't change. The opportunity cost would be constant. So if the PPC curve is a straight line, that means the opportunity cost is constant. If it is what's called uh, bowed out, right? It's, uh, what was the expression? Bowed out from the origin is the expression. That means opportunity cost is actually increasing. So as you move along the PPC curve, if it's bowed out, your opportunity cost increases as you move from the production of one good to another. Now, you might remember the case study that we used, with, with which was guns and butter, right? And it was a ridiculous case study, but it was there for a reason. And the reason is about that idea of resources and how easy it is to transfer resources from the production of one good to another. And you've got guns, you've got butter, and the things, the resources that you use to produce guns are going to be quite different from the resources that you use to produce butter. So the idea is, yes, you can transfer your production process from one to another, but you're actually going to end up losing more in the sense of opportunity cost by doing so. That there are some goods where the resources are not, uh, the word is mutually transferable. All right. Let's take a different example. Let's imagine that you are producing ice cream and the PPC curve has one type of ice cream and another type of ice cream. You know? The resources are pretty much perfectly mutually transferable. So if that's the case, then your opportunity cost should be constant. All right? Because you will lose production right, from one to another, but there is no resource loss in, a, in essence. Right? However, if the two goods are very different, right, then the production of one is going to be really different from the production of another, then you're going to have a big amount of resource loss when you transfer production from one to another. Right? And the idea of that is about increasing opportunity cost or another way to put it is that the resources are not mutually transferable. So therefore, your opportunity cost will increase as you move production from one to another. Wow, amazing. This PPC curve is so cool and so super that it's able to explain this idea about mutually transferable resources and opportunity costs and scarcity and choice and economic growth, all of those things all in one. But wait, as all good infomercials say, there's still more, right? Because not only can your um, PPC curve illustrate all of that, it can also illustrate time travel. Minds blown. It can. Because you think about that idea of, of um, economic growth. You don't see economic growth happening necessarily, you know, one to one, like, this year, you're going to see that progression, that increase in your economy over time. So the two PPC curves, when you have economic growth, are going to illustrate economic, the economic situation in one time period and the economic situation in another. Now, I don't want to confuse you, all right? I really don't. And I know this might start confusing some of you. I apologize if this does, but Honestly, this is just so exciting, right? This is just ugh, ugh, amazing, right? So I'm going to share a, um, a Jamboard with you. I apologize. I know I can actually just add more pages to Jamboards. Um, I got taught that by my tutor group the other day. Um, oh, you can also change the back. Oh, look, I can change the background. Oh, isn't that cool? I tell you. I'm going to start using these jambles more often. More, excuse me, more often. All right, let's draw a PPC curve, just like this. Uh, there it is. Right, and let's put a date in here. Let's make this one 2021. 
Uh, and what we're going to do is we are going to go and we're going to produce capital goods here. Now, we talked about capital goods the other day. I don't know if you remember. All right. Uh, and we're going to talk about consumer goods here. Now, I should have... Before, here we go. Consumer goods. Let's open the chat box as well at the same time. Here it is. Where's the jam board gone? There it is. All right. So, what was a capital good again? A capital good, a capital resource. What is it? Have a think. Man made goods. Fantastic, Adam. Absolutely. They are the resources that we have created to help us in the production process. So the computers, the robots, the assembly lines, the overhead lights, the, the pens, the paper, the, the iPads, right? all of the above. We use those to help us in our production. So they are capital resources or capital goods. Consumer goods, what do we think they are? Pretty much in the title. Goods for consumers. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. In the title, they're goods for consumers. All right. So uh, capital goods would be the ice cream making machine. And the consumer good would be the ice cream. All right. Now, here's the thing. Remember, we talked about those three questions. What, how, and for whom. So we can also consider what about the time. All right. Because think about this. If, if, as society, we say to ourselves, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of making this many ice creams and this many capital goods, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to change our entire economy and we're going to make this many ice creams. So we're going to have less ice creams. But we're going to have more capital goods, so more ice cream making machines. Let's imagine we do that. So there is our gain. All right, there's our loss. All right, so that's our opportunity cost right there. We've lost all of these uh, ice creams, not able to be made but we've gained all of these uh, all of these ice cream making machines. All right. So there it is. Okay. Right. Now, so gained all of these ice creams, these are the capital goods, and lost all of these ice creams, the ice cream making machines gained, ice creams lost. Right? There's our opportunity cost there. So what we've done is we've increased the number of capital goods we're producing. Now, capital goods, those were the goods that we use in the production process to make other goods. Yeah. So if we're making more goods that can then be used to make more goods, then that should mean that in the future, we're able to make more goods. That was our idea before that we talked about of economic growth. All right, there's the economic growth there. So maybe in 2022, We've got economic growth, and it came about as a result of the changing preferences, if you will, in our economy from consumer goods to capital goods. Now, now I, I don't need to tell you this, but I'm going to because it's cool. 
right? This idea where you have made a decision in society, right? And that decision has changed the allocation of resources from consumer goods to capital goods. And that decision has caused an impact going into the future. There is an actual technical term for that. And the technical term is, check this out. Intertemporal choice. Oh, what a term. All right. Let's make it bigger so you can read it. Now, those of you who have watched movies like Endgame, all right, Avengers Endgame, temporal is about time. So we have made an inter-time choice. We have chosen the future over the present. Now, you might be familiar with this sort of argument because this is what people talk about with regards to uh, what's called delayed gratification. You know, the psychological experiments where they put the, the sweets in front of the children and they tell them that if they don't eat the sweets now but wait, then they're going to get more sweets in the future. And then they film them and watch them as they think about whether to eat them now or whether to eat them. Yeah, it's that idea. It's supposed to be an indicator of success. Right? The more you're able to delay gratification, the more you're able to be successful in life. It's some sort of experiment like that. I don't know. It's psychology. Who knows? Right? It's all in the brain. But a lot of that psychology economies, you can design your own economy. You can say, we're going to have more capital goods in our economy. We're going to move away from the instant gratification of having ice creams. We're going to have fewer ice creams because in the future, we're going to be able to have even more ice creams, right, mate, or whatever it is. And if you're wanting case studies, let's, let, oh, let's put a case study in. Fantastic. I like case studies. Uh, how about this one? Right, history students in the room will be aware of this particular country, uh, Japan, and I'm going to say Japan post World War II. The reason why I'm saying Japan post World War II is because you might be familiar with this concept, but after World War II, Japan was an absolute mess. Right, it was kind of knocked all the way back to the Stone Age. Their entire economy was in a ruin. Yeah, and so what they did, the governing body in Japan at the time, what they decided to do after World War II was they decided that instead of focusing on consumer goods, they were going to focus on capital goods. And they poured huge amounts of money into the production of capital goods, the factories, the roading, the, the building of their economy. So rather than say, we're, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, all right? They ended up saying, we're going to choose to design our economy around production. And their economy grew at a tremendous rate. In fact, at the time, the Japanese economy grew so fast that it was actually considered to be a miracle because it had grown faster than any economy anywhere in the history of the world up to that point. It was called the Japanese economic miracle. And it was such an amazing situation that it was a case study that people used, an economic case study people used to study at university. And the reason why I know this is because I had to study it at university. Not had to, but, well, had to because it was part of the course. But it was something that we had to do research into and make presentations on and discuss why it happened and how it happened and all of those other sorts of ideas. It's amazing, the idea of, the Japanese economic miracle, right? Now, since this time, other economies have actually grown fast as well, right? Southeast Asia, which is where we live, right, has also experienced rapid economic growth, right? Uh, China has also experienced rapid economic growth. And part of what they've been doing is copying this idea, this idea that the Japanese did with regards to their economic expansion. And if you are at all interested in the in this sort of time period, you'll notice all sorts of things that people around the world saw what Japan was doing and said, hey, that's pretty cool. Their economy is growing because of it. Let's copy that idea. 
So if you're wondering where things like company mottos and slogans came from, that time period. Uh, company songs, that time period. The idea of having like motivational posters stuck up around your workplace, that time period. All of this came about as people watching the economy of Japan growing at a huge rate. Remember that uh, the, the Japanese economy, it grew so fast that it went from pretty much zero all the way at the bottom of the world with regards to economic growth, all the way, 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 and it became the second largest economy in the world, and it did all of that in the space of 40 years. Now, that's unbelievably quick. Right? And yes, there are some economies that have done very well since then, and obviously China is one, but, you know, you can make an argument about the Chinese economy, and I can certainly debate it at length with you about how they've achieved that. And if you look at China as an overall economy, you're going to find that their growth kind of is stuck around the, the, the sea, right? The edge of the economy that's connected to the sea. And then the further you go back into China, it's, it's like you're going back in time, right? The development further back in China is, is a lot less than on the edge on the coast, right? Whereas Japan, they managed to achieve rapid economic growth faster than any other country in the world. And the way they did it was exactly this, this idea of intertemporal choice. They were giving up current luxuries, if you will, in order to get a future benefit from it. Right, I'm gonna stop doing that. I can give you some stats on that um, in the future potentially, but it's incredible, all right? It is absolutely an incredible idea and an approach. And that's what I say. It's an amazing, amazing uh, economic miracle. And you can study that. There are entire textbooks based around it. Right, so the PPF as a model, as I've said, is an incredible model. There's an awful lot that you can revise and think about and use it for, right, which is why it is such an incredible idea. Uh, we've kind of discussed that, so I'm going to skip past that one. All right. Let's get to this now. Very last thing I want to have a chat about today. This is where we are moving to, right? Should the government intervene in an economy, right? Like the water issues that you are discussing in a lot of your classes, potentially, right? Resource allocation. Who has the resources? Should they have those resources? Who owns them? Right? In New Zealand, that can be a big question. Who owns the resources? All right? What about equity? What about fairness? Right? Is it fair that there are some learners who can't afford to go to school? Right? You get an international education, and a lot of other students don't have that. What about access to the internet? What about food, housing, clothing? Right? Is economic growth sustainable? Can we keep growing at this pace? Right? Or are we going to end up with that sort of climate change issues with the entire economy um, falling apart right? around the world? Sea levels, all of that, overfishing. Can we develop? You know, uh, Malaysia is, is a developing country. That's what its classification is. Malaysia wants to be classified as a developed country. So how much should the government intervene with all of these questions? Should the government put laws and rules and regulations in place? Or should it just let the economy do what it does? These are all really big economic questions, and these are a lot of what we are going to be discussing going forward into the future. I'm going to stop the sharing now. I'm going to jump back to the mute. Now, there's a lot to take in with regards to all of that. The PPF curve, the PPF model is a big one. It is the very first major model that you are going to deal with in economics. Right? It is the very first one that you will deal with that is classified as a macroeconomic model, a big picture model. And it covers so much of the initial introductory concepts and some other macroeconomic concepts that it is a really good one to use so that you can illustrate all of these different ideas. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to be working on your history of economic thought
presentations because that will be next week. We will be delivering those to your peers. That will be fantastic. All right, have a go at that. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to email me or you can stay behind and, and, and ask me a question. Otherwise, things that you should be doing that would be really good to do, obviously organizing your folders, getting everything all set for the year, um, building up your glossary, but revising the ideas that we've covered, right? Scarcity, needs, wants, opportunity costs, um, PPC curve models, ceteris paribus. Just making sure you understand those concepts and ideas, and if you have then questions about them, yes, yes, that's the idea. Uh, well, you say, will you be presenting, um, if you have designed your presentation so that it's an animation, for example, or a video, then that's what you'd present. Yeah? But it has to be you creating it, right? not something you've found online that you're going to show. Does that make sense? Yeah. Again, any questions, you're welcome to ask. Otherwise, as we'd say in the land of my birth, he it up, which means goodbye for now. And have a bit of a mental break before your next lesson, please. And maybe some downtime off the screen to get your eyes to refocus to the real world around us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. All right, young wife. Did you have any? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.